Okay, Thanks we're alive. So All right. We're live. Welcome, everybody. My name is Tara, and I'm here today with my friend Aaron Fisher, all the way from Toronto. Hello. And this is exciting. We're going to be talking about a little juicy living by design, some mindfulness, and good stuff. But I want to formally introduce Aaron before we get going here. And because there's so many good things to talk about, and I think it's good for you to know a little bit about him. So um, Aaron Fisher was born with an innate passion for helping others. In his 20s, he moved to China, created a charity uh, to facilitate schooling for kids in remote towns throughout the country. He has spoken globally at motivational business development seminars and has coached Fortune 500 companies like Yahoo and H&M on leadership and personal development skills. In 2014, he co-founded Copper 88, which I'm excited to talk about, a uh, unique garment embedded with rehabilitation and health attributes. Aaron spray, uh, spearheads the company's research and development team driven by a core value system to help people all over the world feel and live better and healthier lives. His philanthropy includes charities like Covenant House, Future Possibilities for Kids, and many other social empowerment projects. Aaron is also an established photographer, life coach, and currently working on his second book titled Love Letters, which is planned release later part of 2019. How awesome is that? Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Did you disappear? Pardon? <laughs> Did you disappear for a second? No, no, no. I was just, it's just interesting when people read about me. I'm just like, yeah. uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I think she's talking about me right now. <laughs> so, okay, you got to tell me a little bit about China. What? What? How did you decide to go over there when you were 20? Where did that come from? Like, you're, you're adventurous. I know this. I so, the whole thing about China was, um, how do I explain this? I pretty much went through high school not thinking that I could actually achieve anything. And I got kicked out. I ended up going to another place. Um, I got labeled by my teachers as somebody that probably will end up in jail and won't succeed. So with all these labels against me, um, the second that I actually graduated high school, that kind of didn't make sense from what I was told. Um, I was told a lot of what I should be, which was really interesting growing up. And as a kid, you have no other reference to, to, to do it or to, to, to balance it off of. So that's what I thought I was. And when I graduated that, I went to college. And after college, I had amazing teachers that were supportive, that were helping, that were doing so many great things. So when I finished college, I just, I don't know, I, something hit me that I, I was 22. And I thought, okay, I'm 22. If I stay here, I'm going to get married, going to get a job, start a company, get a wife, kids. And I'm like, but I'm 22. Like, there has to be a lot more to life than that. I don't even know who I am. So how am I going to marry somebody? So I did what any normal person would do. I jumped on a plane and went to China for nine years. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That, that, I, that's so awesome. Well, and we were we were just talking, so um, Aaron lives out in Toronto and I'm out in Alberta. So we're on like other parts of Canada and you were just actually out this way doing like a big Spartan race. So that's why I was like, I know you got some adventure in you. What, th what That was your first time coming out to Western Canada, right? Uh, well, I landed in Calgary and then I drove around uh, BC and like, it's so gorgeous. The mountains, the everything. It was just such a beautiful place that that it's just breathtaking. Every time you're driving, like it was the worst. I really didn't want to drive because as I was driving, I'm like staring at the mountain, staring at this stuff. I'm like, okay, eyes back on the road. And I kept on looking and I'm like, uh, how about somebody else drive for a little bit? The sky, the mountains, the water, the energy, the feeling there is absolutely incredible. Yeah. It is. It's beautiful out that way. Big time. Well, I mean, Canada's beautiful all around, but it is really pretty out there. So yeah, uh, you have so like this 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 race that you did. Um, mm -hmm. I know I'm kind of staring off. We're talking about China. We're going here, but we're kind of on this like adventure conversation <laughs> right now. But um, tell me, like, I, I want to talk a little bit about this because some of one of the things that you talk about a lot is um, you know motivation and mindfulness and mental health and you've done a lot of coaching with people and taking on like a big project like going to China and starting a school or flying across Canada and deciding to go on like a 
60 kilometer, I don't know how many days you guys were going for. <laughs> like, what, what, I want to talk a little bit about like what, what kind of mindset is involved? Like, how did you get there? Um, uh, yeah, like how did, how did you get there? Like, I know growing up, we've had conversations before about, you know, this shooting business. And I, I want you to share a little bit about that because I think it's a lot of, it's a good, it's a good conversation. It's a good way. Um, you, you explain it so well. So there's so many things in that. Um, I asked you like five questions in like one question. Did you notice? So let's start <laughs> with the idea of mindfulness and the reason that, um, and kind of my belief behind it, to, to be mindful is to understand that you need to take a moment and realize when your mind is full. Meaning that when you're constantly thinking and thinking and thinking without progression or movement, that in itself is not so mindful. But when you're thinking with movement, thinking with progress, thinking with reflection, that becomes more of a mindful movement. So what I mean is that when we start to speak, you know, and we realize that there's certain things in the conversation that we didn't feel was right or we didn't feel something from it, then we become more mindful of the things that we talk about. But to only think about it, but not to put action in it, doesn't really allow us to do anything. To have, it's like to have eyes that are staring at something, but legs that don't move towards it, doesn't really get us anywhere, right? And vice versa, to have legs that take you somewhere, but eyes that don't see, you'll end up crashing into everything. So it's a, it's this beautiful balance. And the one thing about mindfulness that I like to say is that you don't know. And the two worst words in the English language, there's other ones, is I know. I know, I know, I know, I know. You don't. You don't. You don't. I mean, it's okay. I don't know either. But we're trying, we're learning, we're understanding. And that in itself is very beautiful. But when you say I know, then you become full then there's nothing to change. Well, I know, and it's this and this. No, it's not. If you know, then the situation wouldn't happen, but you don't. None of us do. And once you know, you stop. And once you stop, you don't grow. And once you grow, stop growing, what happens? So the idea here is, with mindfulness, is to look at things and kind of be open and to realize that things are, nobody's against you, nobody wants to harm you. And even the people that you think might want to, they're only doing it because they feel harm in themselves. To create mindfulness is create an awareness. Create an awareness is to create more understanding. More understanding creates more questions. And more questions leads you to new places because we really are the, the property or the product of the questions that we ask. The better the questions we ask, the better life we live. So it's like if you go into Google and you write, why am I dumb? You'll get the, the worst things. But if you're like, how can I progress? How can I learn? And then all of a sudden you have 50,000 different things of how to learn, how to be more progressive, how to produce more, how to become more that you want. So that's just a little bit of the mindfulness. Um, yes. As what you were talking about for uh, other ideas, it's just like, let's say C. As you were talking about the C, the, the one thing that I, I talk about a lot is the the SCE, where people I find, and even myself, have drowned ourselves in the C. And C stands for the should. I should do this. They should do that. All this shoulding. There's so much shoulding in the world that you literally can walk in so much should or somebody can should all over you. But the idea is, in school, the teachers told me what I should be. People tell you what you should. You should. You should. But what are you? Who are you? The idea of a should is almost like a projection of what they think that you can be. But that's just shooting on somebody. The answer or the question of asking somebody, what do you want to be? Or asking them more of a why and progressing makes more sense. With the word, um, you know, it's a lot of like your friends. Well, they should have done this. No, they shouldn't have. You wanted them to do something that you wanted. That has nothing to do with them. Don't control people. People aren't there to be controlled. You know, I should have done this. Don't beat yourself up. It's not that you should have done this or you should have done something else. You did something. 
What can you learn from it? How can you grow from it? Otherwise, you're living in the past of the shoulds, and it doesn't bring you into the present because all we have is the present. Our thoughts are the past and the uh, past of the future. And then comes the expectation, the E. We expect so much, and this is the one of the biggest problems that happens in relationships, especially with parents and you know whatever kind of relationship that you are in. It's let's say this, a father expects his child to be a certain way, but he never tells the child. And the child doesn't live up to this hidden expectation. And he gets mad at the child. And the child doesn't understand why. And yet the, the child in himself wants the father to be a certain way, but doesn't tell the father how to act. And then the father doesn't live up to his expectation, so he gets mad. Here we have invisible expectations. When he comes into a relationship, whatever, if it's boy, boy, girl, 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 whatever it is, uh, there needs to be a, 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 like a moment of speaking of what you think. Instead of trying to get people to live up to something that you're not telling them, why don't you tell them your thoughts, your belief, and your ideas? Otherwise, you're just going to assume that they know, and that's the A. And you know that assuming makes an asset of you, and right? Because that's how it is. <laughs> well, I assume that you do that. Well, that's an expectation. Well, you should have. And then all of a sudden you're drowning. The best thing to do in life and the hardest thing to do in life is, is speak your truth. Be honest. Be open. Share what you really feel. A lot of times we're like, well, what if, what if they don't like it? What do you mean? What if they don't like you? What if they don't like your truth? What if they don't like who you really are? Then maybe that's not the person you need to be with because if you're worried if they'll like you, then who have you been with them all along? And the big thing about that is a lot of us, we, we get lost in these masks and we tend to put on this persona to be a certain way. And we go on social media and we act in a certain way. And eventually this avatar and this person that we create comes so heavy that we want to change, but we don't want people to know who we really are. Because if they know who I really am, well, then, well, maybe they won't like me. Actually, if they know who you really are, the right people will. Because if you're tired, you've been spending too much time fitting in, not enough time belonging. And belonging is what we need. Fitting in is tiring. I fit in in high school. I was tired every day. When I got older, I started finding places where I belong, and I was able to recharge myself. I love it. I love it. You always have such good wisdom to share. Why, why do you think people get into this like should expect assume kind of trap? Because you I mean, you've, you've done extensive traveling and you've met people all around the world. So I'm, I'm sure you've had a lot of experiences with that. Where do you think that really comes from? Well, it comes from a lot. It comes from TV. It comes from media. It comes from parents. It comes from school. It comes from so much. It comes from growing up. It comes from life. You know, a lot of times it's just like we believe that there's a certain place that we should be. We should be funny. We should be this way. But nobody really talks about what we already are. You know, emotions. Emotions are, are such an important thing. Like, for example, as, as a male, and I'll speak about males right now because they have a very high suicide rate because we're told to grow balls, be a man, you know, be strong. Well, I just want to be me. So a lot of times we're like, well, I can't be this way because it's not how it should be. Well, if it's not the way it should be, but that's the way you are, then maybe you take out all these shoulds and just be. Because a lot of times we don't give ourselves permission to be who we are. And without giving ourselves permission, well, guess what? We don't give other people permission. And then everybody's acting in a certain way where they're trying to they're trying to be a way that other people think they are. It's so interesting the way that the world works. You're not who you think you are. You're who you think other people think you are. Right? <laughs> think about that. Yeah. So if you start realizing more of who you are, well, it's like if you're acting a way that makes you tired, that you have to invent yourself every single time, then what you're going to constantly do, and you're going to attract those people in your life that are doing the exact same, because we attract not, we attract not what we want, but what we are. 
And if we are acting in a certain way, that's what we're going to attract. Because a lot of times we think that we're not worthy enough, we're not good enough, that we have to be a certain way, that men have to be strong and women have to wear makeup and life has to be a certain way. And it doesn't. Those are constructs that are designed, and a lot of those constructs are designed by marketing companies. Imagine if every single woman in the world understood how beautiful they were. What would happen? How many industries would go out? Imagine men understood that it's okay to be emotional. Think about how many other things would change in this world. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I know I've got daughters and their teens and that what they see on social media and all that stuff like we didn't I didn't have that when I was their age and so it was I mean we had magazines and those kinds of things but it's not the same way it is today and how quickly information you know passes from one person to the next and it's been it's been really interesting with them um you know really trying to to teach those things and to let them see that you know they are just beautiful exactly the way they are and they don't have to hold up to these certain expectations that they see because you know you've got on social media, hey, this person got 9,000 views or this got, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's just out there, this like competitive like ness is kind of just set up for them versus, um, you know, that state of just being and accepting and, and whatnot. But I, I've seen a lot of, you know, growth in them. So I'm feeling pretty good, you know, with their outlook. But it's, it's I think, hard for a lot of people and parents these days, especially. I think it really is because there's a lot of fake positivity out there. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of individuals that are on social media and on a lot of forms of social media that they're like, you must be positive. Be happy. Positivity is the way to get to where you want to be. When you're positive, you attract things. Being positive can be extremely negative, especially when you're not feeling it. I believe that everybody has worth. Everybody has value. Everybody's okay. But we all have emotions. And imagine saying to somebody with a mental health issue, saying that you must be positive. If you're not positive, then bad things are going to happen. What that does is it makes them feel like there's already something wrong with them and makes it worse. And be like, I have to be positive. I have to be positive. I can't have these emotions. You have emotions because you're supposed to have emotions. You have feelings because you're supposed to have feelings. If you're angry, be angry. If you're depressed, then be depressed. Instead of trying to push it away and say, I can't be this and it must be something else, then be it. Live with it. Relax with it. Breathe with it. Take a moment with it and understand that there's nothing wrong with you for having an emotion or have a feeling. Understand that the emotion and feeling is there to guide you, there to teach you something. And the more that you try to push it away, the harder it will come back. The more we start to suppress it, the more it will come back. The more we yell at it, ignore it, tell it that it's not good, the more it will come back. And especially when you say that it's my sadness and my emotion, because it's not you. It's the emotion. It's the sadness. And it's coming in. So what is it that I want to teach you? For example, a lot of times, let's say you're feeling sad. Let's say it's just a frequency that's coming in. You watch the radio or you listen to the radio and the song comes on. Let's say it's Justin Bieber. You're not all of a sudden thinking, oh, my God, I'm Justin Bieber. Well, what you can do in that sense is you can sing the song, you can change the channel, do whatever. When we get our emotions, we can take moments to listen to us, listen to it without realizing that this is me. And when we're ready, we just change the channel by changing what we want. Get up, go for a walk, do something, eat healthy, and share. Share the emotions. Like today I'm feeling really depressed because this is what's going on. That's good. That gives people permission because... If everybody realized how crazy we were, everybody would realize how sane we were. But it's like, oh, I'm crazy. I can't tell anybody. No, no. Please tell people because by sharing your craziness makes them feel that they're not insane. Yeah. Because how many of us feel that way, but we feel that we're alone? None of us are alone. It's just we create loneliness because we're afraid to share our truth. Because we think it should be, we think people expect it to be a certain way, and we just assume that everybody else is not feeling it. Once again, drowning in the sea of ideas, right? Drowning in the sea of things that don't even exist. But like, I, I believe the more people that you meet and the more true you are to yourself and share your truth, the more permission you give to other people to share their truth. And then all of a sudden, this negativity becomes positive, becomes progressive, and then all of a sudden, there becomes a change. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because it, it, when you when you were talking about social media and and then you know in this I, I guess personal development world, there's a lot of discussion about the sum of people that you surround yourself with and what type of vibration you hold. And I love that you're so honest about that and saying like, yeah, it's great that we are happy and that we're positive and we you know we have these emotions, but there is also those other emotions that. Are we experience and it's real and just because we're experiencing those motions doesn't necessarily mean that you know like they will pass they're in that moment you know we will work through them and it's for now that's maybe what we're feeling but like you said there's a lot of ways and techniques that we can you know get up and change what we're doing and move around and, and shift that kind of stuff but I, I really appreciate your realness on that to say like no I'm not happy all the time I have freak out moments, <laughs> moments where I'm like, gosh, what's going on, you know? Yeah, and there's, a, there's, two, there's two words that we should also take out of our vocabulary is always and never. Yeah. I'm always happy. He's never happy. You n always do this. You never do this. Always and never don't work. Because if you ever meet somebody that said, I'm always happy, give them a hug and say, it's okay because it's impossible, you can't be. Even the greatest Buddhist minds in the world, the meditation, they're not always happy, they're not always sad, but they're aware of the happiness and the sadness and they choose, because our emotions and everything are a choice, but they've spent years and years and years in developing this. They have boundaries of steel. Most people say, well, spiritual people, they're, they're meditative, they, they, they have, um, you know, it, it's through the meditation, it's through the practice that they get it. No, it's boundaries of steel because they know that certain people, they won't lead into their boundaries. Other people, they will. Their routine, food, sleep, everything wow. is their, their boundaries. They know exactly what it is for them to get the things that they need. What do we need? Boundaries. We need people to understand that I am a certain way and if you don't like it, that's okay because maybe I'm not for you. If you go to a buffet, it doesn't mean you're gonna eat everything, but doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with it. If you have a group of friends and you just don't get along with all of them, that's okay. Not everybody's for you. And if people don't get along with you, that's okay. But yet, if we force ourselves into places where we don't belong, what happens is we start to get anxiety, we start to get panic attacks, we start to get worried. We question ourselves, what's wrong with me? Nothing. One of my favorite quotes from Einstein has been and will always be, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, they'll think it's dumb its whole life. Well, in school, my teachers were judging me on the tree. None of them asked me to jump into the water. A lot of kids these days, you're judging them on the tree. Listen, writing a test does not make you smart. Having a high IQ doesn't make you smart. It doesn't. I failed tests. Tests have never been my thing, but if I were to put my worth on a test designed by another person, then I'll always be trying to live up to somebody else's idea. What happens if I'm smart in my own way? What happens if I see the world in my own way? Does that make me wrong? No, but that makes me somebody with a story and perspective. That makes me somebody with a purpose that looks at things in a different way, that wants to live in a different way. And why is that wrong? If you look at all the great minds and the artists and these people, that's what happens. You know, you look at some of these great minds and everybody's like, no, you can't do this. You're a failure, you'll never do it. And they're like, okay, fine, I'm still gonna do it. And then Beethoven happens and Van Gogh happens and some of the greatest minds in the world happen because people are afraid that if you do something that they're not and you succeed, then they have to question their whole worth and their whole system. And a lot of people don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's really interesting because it's, it's a, it's a much more, um, I, I think once the awareness comes in, the process becomes a lot easier because you're, you know, you know, you know that there's, um, yeah, it, I was having this, it was really funny because we were talking about this earlier today and this whole, 
even conversation of boundaries came up. We were having this meeting and everybody was bringing in their different take on it and why, you know, it really is so important to have, you know, those around you, at, you know, today now more, I think, than ever to kind of, you know, be able to, to just be you. And, and, and it's funny because it, it, to me, when I think about it now, like it's, it's taken um, a lot of growth work and life experience and things like that to get to the place where, yeah, I'm like, you don't like me. Oh, well, <laughs> it's me. I'm quirky. I have my moments. I have my other, you know what I mean? We've got those, that, that thing. Right. And it's like, you find the ones that really do align with you and that tribe and how it grows and stuff like that. And then, you know, I find like, it's, it's cool because then you can start to be real and it opens, it's like that light, you know, when you mean you're kind of like shining for others to see. So I love how you said that because when people retract and they don't show themselves, you know, it doesn't give permission for others to do the same. So it's, 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 it's an interesting thing. It it's is. true though. You really do need to find ways and I'm not, okay. So one of the sayings that I say, it's like, you must first love yourself before you love others. I disagree. I believe that finding ways to like yourself and love yourself is important, but I believe that you can still find ways to love yourself by serving others, by helping others, by doing things for others. I believe that if we put so much pressure on ourselves that I must love myself before I love others, well, what happens is a lot of times women in relationships, nope, I must first love myself, and then they don't end up being with men and men being the exact same. Well, it's not that you're going to love yourself. It's the fact that love and you are going to constantly change. Your ideal of love and your idea of self will constantly change. So how can you progress? How can you grow? How can you start liking a little more about who you are? Because through that, you'll discover a form of love. Through that, you'll discover a form of worth and a form of value. I believe that strong opinions and, and facts of to have this, you must have that. No. Nope. Take a breath and breathe, live, feel emotions, be human, because you'll find that an equation that used to work for other people might not be for you. And that the, the idea of success, don't follow other people's idea of success unless you have taken your word of success and defined it, your word of purpose and defined it, don't follow other people because you're going to end up getting the house and the car and the whatever things that you want and realize that maybe that's not what I wanted. Same thing about love. I need love. I, 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 I'm dying for love. It's just like, so what's your definition? What do you mean? Well, how can you want something so bad if you can't define it? And why does it matter so much to you? Because there in itself is the question of what am I without it? So what am I with it? To understand a lot of these ideas really makes a very big impact in our life. When you redefine your words, you redefine your world. So for example, words are all made up. Every single one's made up. So when somebody says something to you, somebody's saying a made up word to you, but you are the one that's taken the definition and the feeling to it and given it to it. So when they say to you, it hurts. So if you were to redefine the word stupid, right? I've been called that a lot when I was younger. And I took the word stupid as lack of knowledge, meaning that I need to learn more. So if somebody calls me stupid now, I'm just like, yeah, you're right. I do need to learn more. Thank you. So what you've done is you've disarmed something. And by redefining these things, redefining these things, all of a sudden you're disarming these words that once hurt you are now bringing you up and progressing you and making you learn. Yeah. So what, like, hey, what, what's your take on the difference between like, like, you know, like this Spartan race you just ran, like what, what's the difference in that, you know, to, to take yourself to that level where you have that capacity to, to push through something as extreme as that? Well, I used to smoke and I've quit for, I think it's about 16 years. Um, and it hurt quitting. Um, quitting smoking actually was, no, no, sorry. I smoked for 15 years. I've only quit for about six years. And quitting was one of the hardest things because my lungs started to breathe and the tar and the nicotine started to crack. And I understand why a lot of people go back to smoking because I was almost in tears. So I decided to go for a run. I went for a five 
hundred meter run and I was out of breath. And through the years, I would just add in a little more, add in a little more. And until eventually uh, I had a friend about three years ago that said, let's go for a race. So I went for a race. And running in that race, I learned so much about myself, of my breath, of my body, of the movement that though I had to stop, I still completed it. And then what it started teaching me was more and more of when you put yourself into situations that are difficult, that's when you learn, that's when you grow, that's when you thrive, not survive, but that's when you start to really learn more about yourself. And through those, I decided to sign up for another one and another one and another one, and I just wouldn't stop because it's like, okay, I have these thoughts. Well, now these thoughts have to run with me. You can't do it, you can't achieve this. I'm like, you know what? You are you could be right, but I'm still gonna take that foot. And then I cross that line, it's just like, I'll catch you at the next race. And then the next race is like, you can't do it? And I'm like, okay, it's more of a question now. And the next race is like, you can do it. And then it <laughs> shifts and it constantly changes. It's like, what I've said is, instead of telling these voices in your head to shut up, instead of trying to prove them wrong by yelling at them or negotiating with them, just do it. If it says you can't, then just do it. When I was in China, and I had my art gallery and I was traveling around. Um, so what happened was I was working with kids from primary to university schools and we would do uh, one week camps for about eight weeks and some of the most beautiful things we've ever done. At the time I was not in a good place in my life but I was really good at regurgitating stuff that sounded great. You can do this and you're amazing and if you just believe in this way and all this stuff that, that sounds so good that we can pick up off the net. <laughs> At the end of every class, um, after the end of every week, they would write a note saying, um, I put little hearts on the walls, like a heart of envelope, and they would write envelopes to me and other kids. And they're like, thank you so much. You inspired me. You made me feel great. No, no, no. And I felt like crap. Here I am telling everybody how to be successful, how to do things. It's like writing a book on how to be successful, but not being successful, but hoping the book would be so you can be. You know what I mean? It's just like I just was able to regurgitate stuff that I personally wasn't living. So at the end of one year, I said I had enough. I, I ended up going on this trip and I ended up standing at this mountain. And while I was at this mountain, I was looking at it. And that voice in my head said, what are you doing? You can't do it. Just give up. Just take the chair though. And I said, you know what? Every time I tell you to shut up, you come back. Every time I tell you to be quiet, you come back. Every time I try to ignore you, you come back louder. I'm like, maybe you're right. But I'm gonna try anyways. And I ended up climbing the mountain. And it got quieter. I ended up climbing another one and another one. I climbed up five, went on a 65K bike ride, continued to do it. And I realized that these voices in our head are actually a survival mechanism. Our body is meant to do two things, reproduce and survive. When you put it into danger, all of a sudden it, it's like, what do we say to this person? You can't do it, you can't achieve it. Until you do, and then you show that it's okay. It's almost like a mother, it's just like, you can't do this, and you do it, the mother's like, okay. I see, I trust you a little more now. And each time it's like a belief, a belief, a belief, and then it, it eases up. Well, at the end of that, I took a lot of pictures and I'm like, I wanna do something for the kids because the kids did something for me. And I saw my Chinese friend and I showed her all the pictures I took and I said, I'm gonna take these pictures, I'm going to change them around, I'm gonna put them on a canvas, I'm gonna open up an art gallery and I'm gonna sell it and I'm gonna raise money for the kids in the countryside for their education and she's like, that's a great idea, but you need better pictures because these are all really ugly. <laughs> and at that moment, I realized so much that she wasn't telling me that it was ugly. What she was, she was that voice of doubt standing in front of me saying, Aaron, how many times do you say things? How many times do you say you're going to achieve something? How many times do you say that you're going to do things and you don't? I'm not saying I don't believe you. I'm not saying that I do, but what are you going to do about it? So I opened up a gallery in Beijing called The Awakening. And that's why 
later on, I opened up the Awakening Self, which is my Instagram. But I ended up opening it up and I sold the art. Never let somebody's opinion become your reality. Create what you want and there always will be somebody to support. We have billions of people in this world. No matter what you do, there will be somebody that will support you. Be yourself, be truthful, and move towards your heart and what you truly believe. So I opened it up, raised money, went to the northwest of China, worked with different schools, and did great things. Things that where I'm standing with these kids, I'd leave in tears being like, who am I? Like, how am, how am I doing this? I, I've always wanted to do this, but, but how is this possible? It's because when you start to move towards your own dreams and your own ways, it's amazing the things that get out of your way. Yeah. I love it. That's a great story. All of it. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, I, like I can relate, like I, um, you know, into the, like the marathon thing and stuff. I used to do a lot of skiing and things like that and long distance running when I was younger. And there's those days where you get into it and you think, am I crazy right now? <laughs> you know, like on a big long, I remember doing one, and my parents were driving beside me like, great, honey. And I'm like, Grr, go away. <laughs> I'm like, don't look at me. They're like taking pictures. I'm like, I want to throw your camera right now. <laughs> like, shoo, shoo. And you question why you do some of these things. But like, I so agree with you. It's like when you go through these like difficult things in life or obstacles that come up, you really do grow and you really learn a lot about yourself. And um, it, it, it really, it changes you in so many ways. And it really like, like that, like you say, going there to China and all of a sudden you have this art gallery and you're helping people and, you're like, how did I do all this? Really, it's just that like inching that little bit forward. And once you get like to the top of the hill, you can see further and take that next step and have an idea of what to do. And I think it's so cool. I think like, gosh, you've done like leadership stuff with like some pretty big companies. Like that's, it's, that's pretty spectacular. <laughs> so when I actually got to China, so th there's, there's a saying in life, they say, fake it till you make it. I don't believe in that. I believe that Believe it until you achieve it. My whole life, I've always believed that I was a consultant. I could always be a consultant. So I went to China and straight up, they asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm a consultant. They said, okay, then you're a consultant. I'm like, great. So they send me to my first Fortune 500 company at the age of 22 and I walk in and this is Siemens. And I walk into the room and all the top notch people are sitting in there and I'm there to consult. So I give them a piece of paper, I open up my PBT and I'm talking and I'm telling them and I'm telling them and I'm telling them all this stuff. And I felt amazing after an hour. Like I finished, you know, um, I walk out of the room. Oh, before I walk out of the room, I gave the evaluation sheets and then I collected them, got out of the room. And there's something called presentation sensation. When you do a great presentation, you feel like you're walking on the cloud. And this is something that's called also perspective. Because the way that you see something is not the way that it actually is. <laughs> so a week later, the the um, the office looks at my evaluation sheets, and they all told me that they will never send me back. They said that they don't know who I was, they don't ever want me to come back, and that was the worst consulting experience they've ever had in their life. And I was like, ouch. <laughs> but ask why and they told me they said you walked into the room and you told everybody you never asked them and I realized that being consultant is not about sharing your knowledge when it comes to situations it's about giving an opportunity to hold the space for them to share their ideas and then to move together to find a solution now I came in it's like me coming up to you and you saying Oh, I'm sad. I'm like, okay, great. Let me tell you how to be happy. But I don't know why. I don't know what's going on. And as a consultant, I also learned throughout when I go into meetings, people are like, we need better communication. And I'm like, okay, why do you think so? Well, because of this. So if you were to get better communication, then what would change in the organization? Well, this, this, and this. I'm like, oh, so what you're looking more for is problem solving, if I hear you right. Oh, yes. Just because somebody says something doesn't mean that's what they mean. That's just a surface area. We got to get to the root cause. And what I did, I only just heard what the topic was and I just 
went in and I did it. And then again and again, and I tried. Um, I ended up leaving that company. I ended up going to consult. Um, this one company was phenomenal, I, like Yahoo, IBM, and I walked in and I loved it. And as I was there for like two months, I didn't know that the company was going bankrupt, the one that I was working for. So, cause I'm like, I'm not getting paid, but I love what I do. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't even care for the payment. I just want to do this. But you know, eventually reality sticks in and I really do need to, I need to get payment. And um, <laughs> they end up going bankrupt. They ended up closing. Um, pretty much what happened is they invested a lot of money in the wrong things and things that didn't matter and asking the wrong questions. And that's fine. But they gave me an opportunity and they helped to teach me better ways to consult and better ways to be around some, some really important people. After that, I went to real estate. And after real estate, I ended up opening up the art gallery. And then when I did the art gallery, which was interesting because I'm like, you know what? I just want to give back. I just want to serve. I want to, these kids have been everything to me. And after I did something like that, I ended up going to Shanghai to my friend's office, had a great conversation. People were asking me who I was, what I did. And I told them, and like, I was just beaming because I'm like talking about these kids and talking about making a difference. And like, these kids went from like a very low examination rate to a very high one in a short period of time, not because of me, but because we found somebody in their community that was already doing something great. And we just reintroduced them to them. And then they copied the local people's style. And then we left. The idea of a charity is not to stay. The idea of a charity is to walk in, help find somebody who already doing it well, get them to take over, and then walk away slowly as if you were never there. Mm -hmm. And um, a week later, the boss from that company called me. And he's like, I would like to see you. I'm like, OK. And uh, I had a presentation and I ended up working at my dream job. They fully trained me. The first week I was in Bangladesh for three weeks. They shot me to all these places and it was phenomenal. And I loved it because I always believed it. And that's the thing. It's like, just because you're starting doesn't mean that you're going to get it hundred percent right. And if you do, congratulations, but there's going to be people along the way that are going to say stuff. There's going to be times where you're not going to do exactly what you thought you did, but it's about questioning and learning from it. Understanding that people aren't trying to attack you. If you listen hard enough, people are actually there to teach you in many ways. And sometimes that's what we have to do to listen and know that just what do you believe in? What do you truly want to do in your life? What do you believe in? If you don't know, then try a lot of stuff because eventually you'll figure out there's a pattern and there's a thing, there's a pattern in what you're doing. And from that pattern, you can create your beautiful future, whether it's working for somebody or working for yourself. So that was um, a very interesting journey. I mean, don't get me wrong, during the time, like, listen, I wasn't always like, I believe, I believe. No, there's some days where I'm like, I'm depressed. I became overweight. I got up to 230 pounds. I ended up spending two, two years not looking in the mirror because I didn't want to look back at my face because I knew the second I did, I'd have to change. And it was just so much easier not to do that. And then I told you about the trip with the mountains. I actually ended up losing about 30 pounds in that month. It was all emotional stuff, stuff that I was holding on to. And then I just said, just do it. And I really believe that that's my mantra in life. Just do it. Because it's the only way that you'll learn. Yeah. yeah. We just need to do it. We need, it. We need an Aaron logo, though. <laughs> just do it. Just do yeah. it. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, Copper 88. It's cool. Thank you. Like, yeah, I was like, I was like checking out the videos. I'm like, this is really awesome. I was like, okay, like, where did this all come from? Like the, the whole premise behind it and the product and the, the benefits, like just, just share. I don't even know what to ask. I just want to know. <laughs> so after my, I was, I was living in Shanghai and it was about time for me to go back. Um, I did, but it's like, the funny thing is like, once you achieve your dream, you realize that you have other dreams that you want to achieve. You know, there's living the dream, but after you, you do reach it, there's more that you want to do. And after I reached that dream, I realized there was more. 
when I was in Shanghai, um, my dad's business partner actually approached me and he said that we have clothing with copper in it. And I'm like, yay, that sounds good. And he's like, I'm like, he's like, would you be interested in working on this? I'm like, um, give it to me. So I took it and I gave it to a lot of people um, from bikers to old ladies, <laughs> to old lady dancing, the old lady dancing, I'll tell you an interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> because in China, a lot of times in the evening, it's one. Of, it's a magical place because you see old older people at night dancing and moving, and like the elderly really do move in ways that I wish would would translate in some places in North America as well. And I gave it to the old ladies dancing, and I gave it to athletes, and I had a lot of people come back and said this is great. Some people came back that said this is good, and some people came back that said I didn't feel much but nobody came back and said that this hurts. So here I have a product. When I went to the old ladies that were dancing, um, it was really cute because they're like, so uh, they're like, I have my daughter, she's single, let me introduce you. And I'm like, no, I'm okay. I'm like, I just want to know how the product was. They're like, okay, did a little dance with them and I, I walked out. <laughs> then we took the uh, product, then I moved to Canada, took the product, uh, me, my brother, uh, we worked on the branding, the design, the shape. We came up with the packaging and put it all together. And see, there's a theme. I, I always want to be part of something that can help. And Copper 88 has been an extension that allowed me to be with a product that's been able to help a lot of people with aches, pains, and do things that... I'm very grateful for. I remember I had a paraplegic. He sent me an email saying that I love your socks. Um, let me know when you have another t-shirt or shorts because I like to wear it. So of course I sent him a t-shirt and shorts. And then he sends me a picture wearing it. And I was just like, like to be part of that, you know, to get messages from grandmothers, um, from, from, from different people saying, thank you. It, it's, it's like, all, I'm not like, you're welcome. I'm like, no, thank you. Thank you for, for, for trying it, for believing, for the support. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for this. So Copper 88, through this, and I really do believe that our whole, fam, our whole family of Copper 88, meaning the boss and the people that work in the factories and the people in, in the office, we all care. We want the best out there. We have one of, you know, we have the best product out there, but we don't sell it they're expensive because we want to make sure that everybody can afford it. You know how it is when you have an ache in the pain, how expensive that could be. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to break the bank off of it. I want, I wanted to create a product that focuses on you while you focus on life. I want a product that you can wear that people wouldn't know that you're wearing. I wanted a product that could help. And that's what we created. And I love, I go to like different uh, events and, I always ask people, I'm like, so how is that? And they're like, oh, it's great. Or they're like, well, I prefer this. And I'm like, thank you. And I'm always taking notes. I'm always asking because we're amazing, but we can always get better. And I want to know what people truly think without knowing who I am, because that's the real way to grow. And a lot of times it's, it's, just, it's just a beautiful, humbling experience to be part of something that really is making a change and really is making a difference. And that is one of the things I do on the side. I do a whole bunch of other stuff, but everything I do is an, ex an extension of who I am. And who I am is somebody who just really wants people to understand that they have worth, they have value, that they're okay the way that they are, and that they're not alone. They're not alone. And that the more we share our truth, the more we realize that we aren't alone. And the more we share our truth, the more we realize that we have a lot more in common. You know, there's a lot of people that I've met that have committed suicide. There's also a lot of countries where people commit suicide. But if you take these people and you put them in a room and you were to ask them all why they wanted to do it, they'd be like, shit. You feel that too? Right? We tend to want to show our happiness. We don't want to show our, our sadness. Showing our sadness can create moments of happiness for people around the world. Our positivity is not always positive, and our negativity is not always negative, but our fake positivity can create negativity. The word always happy, never sad, 
I don't, I don't, you can say it, but I don't believe you because I see through you. Because I have days where I'm like, oh, I'm on top of the world. And then I have days where I'm like, I just need a moment. <laughs> and it's okay. And it's okay to do that because you're fine, right? If you need a day, you need two days, it's okay. Take your moment. But also understand that you got to take, you got to get up. You got to go for a walk. You got to eat something healthy. You got to take these changes in your, in your life. You, the, you are the answer, but you are also the problem a lot of times. And the biggest time we're a problem is we think there's something wrong with me. Why can't I be like anybody else? If you, everybody's like, why can't I be like everybody else? So it's just like, everybody wants to be like everybody else, but it's like, but you know what? You can do yourself better than anybody else can. Boom. <laughs> right? Yeah, totally. Okay. We have to book, book, the book. Yes, the book. <laughs> it's coming out yeah the book is coming out so the idea so was so the idea behind the book is I, i've been on i've been on instagram for a very long time and i've written letters to myself the way it works is this i believe that um i don't really believe in the past and the present and the future in the sense that just because it was the past doesn't mean that you can't speak to it just because it's the future doesn't mean that you can't influence it. What I mean is this, when I had days where I was sad, suicidal, didn't care about life, and I just, just didn't wanna be part of it anymore, I always had a voice that would just speak to me. And I believe that that voice is my voice of the present. And I forgive the person in the past because it's not that they did anything wrong, they did everything right. Because they went through all the hardships and all the pain and everything, they allowed me to be who I am. So I'm grateful for my past because if they didn't do it, I'd be doing it now. And by speaking to your past, frees you in the present to become whatever you want in the future. So when I do my posts, I always write my posts to one person because I also believe that when you write to everyone, nobody listens. But when you write to one person, everybody feels it. This is why when they do TV shows and um, like those infomercials, they're not like, a million people die. People are like, oh, wow. But they're like, this little child yesterday while going to his home died. You're like, oh, no. And there's a connection. So when we speak to one person, we connect with everybody. But when you try to connect with everybody, you connect with no one. And these notes that I wrote were my love letters of to different people around the world that I just felt that just needed some words. So that's the compilation of the love letters. So that's where it is, just so people can know that they're okay. Yeah. I love it, that's amazing. That's such a great idea. It, and it's so true, it's so true, I'm excited. So you're gonna have to keep us posted when it comes out and then we we'll have to chat all about that too. Yeah, I can't wait. It's, it's been nice, I've already, I've, so I've written three books, no sorry, two books, but they're, they're just for myself. Mm -hmm. I I always wanted to write a book and I challenged myself to write a book and I did. And I have the only copy in my, well, I had two copies. I gave one to a friend, but I have one of the copies in my room. And I look at it every day to remind me that anytime I say I can't do something, it's not that I can't. It's just that I'm just being lazy. <laughs> I love it. I've got my, my grandfather ski jumped like you're in his earlier days. Mm -hmm. And so I've got this picture of him jumping off um, like the ski, like, you know, the ski jump thing. And like back then they were like no helmets and it was like leather straps like around your feet. So yeah. I keep that one up in my office and I'm like, there's nothing more crazy. Than that. So well, at least it keeps my drive going to be inspired to, you know, try something. Right. I'm like, if grandpa can jump off a cliff and, you know, whatever, and two wooden <laughs> skis strapped to his foot, I'm like, to try this you know maybe <laughs> yeah. um thank you so much Aaron it's always like so wonderful hearing your insight and your take on everything I always enjoy our conversations they're just so insightful and they're always so inspiring is there anything that you want to excellent be mindful of your time is there anything that you want to leave us with before you go even though you said like gold nugget after gold nugget after 
copper nuggets, you know, <laughs> all these good things. Honestly, like the only thing, the only thing I really do want to share with people in the world is that you're okay, that you're, you have worth and you do have value and that you are worthy of love to be love and to give love and that you're not alone. And that really when you give yourself permission to be who you are, you free and give more people permission to be who they are. And no matter what you go through in life, no matter what you're feeling, know that you are okay. Those are the things that I share with people because it's true. Yeah, you're having a bad situation. Yeah, you're having a bad day. Yeah, negative things are happening, but you're okay. Love it. Hmm. Beautiful and true. I love it. Yes. Well, thank you. This has been absolutely amazing. Aaron also recently started his CarCast podcast. I don't know if I'm going to say it right, but you're going to want to check that out because he has some awesome, insightful conversations thank and you. it's fun. It's good. You guys talk about some good stuff. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm always in the car anyway, so I might as well do something with it. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> I love it. I think it's awesome. So we, uh, of course, I will post some links below where you can uh, find out more about Aaron if you want to find out more about Copper 88 product. And um, we're, we really have to talk about your book when it comes out. And we're gonna have to do this again sometime. I would love to. Thank amazing. you so much for your time yeah. and everything. You're amazing. Oh, well, so are you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody watching. If you watch this live, say hello where you're from. If you're watching on the replay, do the same. We'd love to know. And thank you much, so, so much for joining us. Uh, when we're talking about all this juicy lemon stuff. So. <laughs> and, and that it, because we'll see you all next time. Thanks again, Aaron. Bye, everybody.